first question that was asked um, when Richard had finished speaking was how far um, does this theory extend uh, down into status groups? And my job today, in 15 minutes flat, is to convince you that medieval peasants, late medieval peasants, had uh, an understanding of the principles of medieval science. That, that's my, my aim today. Um, I think it's fair to say that when it, when, when it comes to late medieval farming, we already know a great deal. We're able to, through archaeology, uh, reconstruct landscape. You can see from the aerial shot here the vestiges of uh, ridge and furrow in Elton, uh, which is where we're going to be concentrating on today. It's now um, largely pastoral, but in the Middle Ages it was a Midlands champion uh, arable region. We know a lot about what was being produced, we know how they were producing it, and we have a fairly decent understanding of the expected results, the yields that we were expecting to see. But what we don't know a great deal about, I would contend, is um, we don't know anything about the mentalities that underpinned this um, agricultural set of uh, processes. Going back to the things we do know, um, we know that maintaining soil quality was of paramount importance, whether we're talking about manorial officers or whether we're talking about people right at the um, level of the peasant. Um, understanding the qualities of the soil and thinking about where to deploy those all-important uh, stocks of fertiliser might have been the difference between having a really good year or having a, a, an absolutely terrible year, particularly uh, at the level of the peasant. We're talking, of course, subsistence farming. Um, if we took perhaps a typical uh, half yard land plot of 15 acres, this is just on the edge of um, subsistence levels, we're not talking about um, a great deal, a great quantity of manure that's being produced, and it would have been fundamentally important to think very carefully about where that fertiliser might have been um, deployed. Um, one of the ways in which we can get at understanding how medieval peasants saw the landscape that they lived and worked in is through field names, the field names that they bestowed upon the land. And it's generally accepted now that uh, these names were coined by peasants, uh, in some instances, probably in the late Anglo-Saxon period, um, but when we encounter them in abundance, it's through the um, documentation of the 13th and 14th centuries, um, which is where I come in because I'm a, I'm a documentary historian interested in landscape. Um, these field names are selected and retained over a long period of time. Um, despite some dynamics, there are certain name types that endure for hundreds of years, and I want to explore today one of the reasons why that might be the case. Um, we're going to um, largely spend our time in this beautiful um, spot in the Midlands. This is Elton in Huntingdonshire, um, and as I've already said, it's a, a largely arable environment. Before we um, uh, start turning to the fields themselves, I think it's important to think about how we think about field names today. And this is one of the themes that, that runs through the papers that we've already heard this afternoon, that we have um, an obsession with taxonomy and classification, um, and never more so, I feel, than when thinking about um, names, field names in particular. The great... Um, field name scholar, uh, and his name is John Field, I haven't just made that up, <laughs> suggests that there are 21 categories, I've given you just a sample here of three, 21 categories in which we can um, classify medieval field names. So here um, he's describing certain types of crops that are being grown, peas, rye and beans, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is used as a means of us interpreting and understanding medieval field names. But I would argue that um, this takes the names, first of all, out of their landscape context, which c can't be a good thing. Um, and also, I would suggest that a medieval peasant looking at a classification of this type would not see the validity in the 21 categories that uh, John Field um, has left us with. Uh, we need to think about these names in a slightly different um, uh, context. There are certain name types, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this, that these are the name types that I'm going to mostly be talking about today, that John Field, and I'm paraphrasing here, tells us are so dull that there is nothing that we can learn from them. 
um, Sandy Field, Chalk Close, Clay Hill Field, the kind of name that is very descriptive of uh, landscape. Um, we, we can't learn anything more from that. They yield up everything that um, we need to know about names of this type. So I think that we are looking at um, a case, a chronic case, of classification over contextual analysis. And what I want to do today is to try and think like a, a late medieval peasant and to put these names back into the landscape context. Because we're, this is a paper fundamentally about medieval science, before we turn to the fields, I want to um, talk first of all a little bit about um, uh, the understanding of science um, in this period and luckily I don't need to go through this schematic because Richard has already taken us through it, it's Beertforth's um, uh, schematic of the universe but I wanted to draw your attention to this um, extract from Beertforth's Enchiridion now Beertforth is a scholar uh, but fundamentally he's also a teacher um, at Ramsey Abbey um, in the heart of the, of the Fens and his main job is to teach young oblates. So these are fairly young boys coming in, getting a reasonably um, decent formal education. But unfortunately for poor Beertforth, he's also responsible for teaching secular priests. People coming in from the outlying parishes, these will be uh, young men uh, with no formal education whatsoever. Um, he's not thrilled, um, to be fair, at the prospect of teaching them. He doesn't have very nice things to say about them. But nevertheless, when we look at um, uh, elemental theory, which is of course what um, Beertforth is describing here, from the other papers today you will instantly recognise this, Beertforth tells us that these ideas are a commonplace so in other words, um, we don't need to have a formal uh, classroom education in order to understand um, this particular way in which uh, the universe is organised and works. This um, also comes through in later didactic texts, and we're going to turn now to the 13th century. Uh, first of all, to the Encyclopedia of Bartholomew the Englishman, um, and now we are um, getting closer to um, the fields of late medieval England. So what Bartholomew tells us is that if we are growing uh, wheat, we need to take heed of the ground that it's sown in, and in particular, the quality of the ground that it's sown in. Now, this has taken on a completely new meaning, I imagine, for you now. Um, you might have had a different reading of that text before you'd heard um, particularly what, what Richard had to say earlier, because, of course, we are talking about whether this ground is hot and dry or uh, wet and cold. Um, Moving on to a um, slightly later document, uh, one that you might be more familiar with, Walter of Henley, one of the greatest agricultural treatises of the late 13th century. Um, and here, uh, Walter is counselling us to think again about the type of ground into which we might be uh, sowing our crop, but also the time of the year in which we're doing it. So Walter suggests that chalky and stony land is excessively dry and if we don't take into account the time of the year in which we're uh, sowing um, the barley seed or the wheat seed then we are likely to um, encounter problems. If the, land, if, the, if the season is excessively dry, the land will harden, the crop will fail. Of course Medieval uh, people knew instinctively what modern science already uh, knows, and that is that um, uh, stony lands are amongst the most uh, dry soil types. There are scientific um, papers that have been written on just this. So the whole um, the, the idea here is to think about uh, balance. Um, this is the next quote is a little bit more hard hitting and here I think Walter is going over the top to hammer this message home. So he is um, describing three materials, uh, well two materials and one season which are all hot. So um, the dung first of all, I'm sure we've all seen a steaming dung heap, we don't need to, um, uh, to be told where that would fall um, in terms of its qualities. Um, if we lay it on gravelly ground, which is also hot in the summer, these three heats will be too much for the poor crop, which will vex and burn, um, as uh, Walter announces. 
So um, this is a text that is aimed at um, a steward, not a medieval peasant. A peasant wouldn't have read this particular document. Peasants are the ones getting their hands dirty. The stewards are probably minor gentry who have almost certainly never um, got their hands dirty, tasted the soil, um, uh, and, and, and uh, understood it in any fundamental way. So this is aimed at a very specific um, audience. Now, if we turn to some of the field names, um, most of these are Elton, some of them are from elsewhere. And as you can see, um, I've very carefully picked out the most boring uh, field names under um, John Field's classification. But what I would want to argue is that um, these aren't purely descriptive, that they are giving us um, practical information uh, rather than just simply describing terrain. If we have a look at um, one of these names uh, in particular, um, clay furlong in Elton, it's the brown blob um, that you can see. I, I hope you can, you can see it. This is only um, interesting because it's an aberration. The, the great mass of clay soil in this territory is the cross-hatched area to the right of the slide, taking up a good two-thirds of Elton's um, landscape. So clay furlong only makes sense because it describes a very specific area within the field system of uncharacteristic soil. So what we're getting here is some kind of mnemonic device, some kind of warning to peasants that they need to treat this part of the landscape slightly differently. Um, Walter of Henley mentions these name types as being especially problematic, if we remember. Clay, sandy, stony. These are um, field types that come with a warning uh, sound. So I wonder whether we're talking about a system that helps us to understand how best we might treat um, this particular landscape. If we take that a bit further, um, here we've got Molwell Hill. Um, this name um, almost certainly comes to us from the late Saxon period. It's still a name that's in use in the 13th and 14th centuries, in fact right down to the 16th century before it, the name mutates slightly. And it's derived from um, uh, three elements, gravelly soil, the mole, weller, spring, and of course um, hill. And um, there is a reason why this name has been retained, I think. And if we think about it from an elemental perspective, we are being given a set of information to interpret. So the, the wet um, spring is being tempered, perhaps, by the, the hot, gravelly soil. And we are being given some instructions on how we might treat this field. Here is Molwell Hill. Um, it's not very exciting, I grant you. Um, but right along the top, uh, the ridge along the top, runs this seam of limestone brash, um, which you can see pictured. It, it doesn't cover the entire field. But the point that I want to make here is that there are um, over 150 surviving field names for Elton, which is almost certainly going to be almost the entire corpus for the three field system in operation in the 14th century. There is not one other field name with the combination of Weller Hill. And so if we were looking at pure description, if we wanted to just say, oh yes, yes, it's the field that's got the spring in it on the hill, Weller Hill would have sufficed. Why do we need to retain that um, earlier element? And I think the reason that we need to retain it, again, is because it's a mnemonic device. This is a problematic furlong and it needs specific treatment. Um, the same can be said of, of another Elton field name. I can't locate this one on the ground. This is Chiselstone Howe. This is even more problematic because we've got two very, very dry elements. Um, and so, again, we'd need to think, if we were a medieval peasant, we'd need to think very carefully about what time of the year we might want to manure that field and how much manure we might want to deploy. Um, so, um, in each instance, without the first element, um, these names don't really make sense, I don't think, from the perspective of uh, a medieval farmer. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, this is all very well, um, but it's a bit speculative. We can't absolutely say with any certainty that this proves that medieval peasants understood uh, science in this period. But we're quite fortunate because we have some written evidence that says they do. Um, 
This extract comes from an account roll um, from the early 14th century, and it tells us about two um, peasants going to Facet Fen near Peterborough. It's a detached attachment of Fen to visit the beasts and bleed the pigs, and we're given a date. Um, and just in case you're, the mind is now boggling, it's perfectly normal um, to have um, the idea of porcine bleeding. In fact, you can bleed, thank you, Richard, you can bleed birds. How you do it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you're archaeologists, so, you know, it's experimental stuff. You probably want to um, have, a, have a think about that. But the, the key word on this slide is garcionum. Garcionum means, um, well, it historians translate it as groom but essentially it means a landless peasant so we're not talking about an elite peasant uh, we're talking about empiric practitioners um, who will have had absolutely no um, informal or formal education other than um, learning at their father's um, feet in the field and this is quite um, a technical medical procedure um, bleeding a pig. I certainly wouldn't like to have a go at it. Um, and um, uh, these peasants are being paid to go and, and, and do just that. But there's more information here on this slide because we're given the date, the 29th of April 1308. Um, most of you, I'm sure, will know that um, uh, humoral theory and uh, uh, the idea of bloodletting works in alignment with the lunar calendar. So there are good days to bleed people and pigs and bad days in which to bleed and in uh, on this date we were in the eighth phase of the moon the eighth day of the moon and this uh, lovely mnemonic folkloric poem tells us that this is a good day to bleed your pigs so not only um, have we got peasants um, actually um, practicing uh, scientific medicine um, in terms of its procedure, but they're doing it in accordance with the, the, the written rules um, for bloodletting. Now, if we go back to um, the fields via um, the manorial accounts again, uh, what I'm especially interested in is trying to, um, and again, this is a theme that's been coming through all afternoon, to look at familiar documents, familiar texts, whether that's um, uh, something, um, the landscape um, or, or, or material culture in new ways. Um, most historians would read this and think, right, okay, it's just telling us about dung. That is, it's not that interesting to anyone except Richard, but it's, you know, that we, can, we can move on. There's nothing to see here. But actually there is, because what we're being told is that between Michaelmas and Christmas, in the cold, wet seasons, um, not only are we gathering the dung in, but we're spreading it on the fields. Whereas... Between Christmas and Lammas, as we move into spring and summer, we're just collecting it. We are not taking it out into the field. Now, um, the account rolls of the um, Bishopric of Worcester tell us that this was an exceptionally dry year with an exceptionally hot summer. So another way to read this might be that this is a pragmatic um, manager at work here saying this is not the time to be spreading the dung in the fields boys we do not want to do that um, according to what um, Walter of Henley is suggesting we are going to um, ruin the crop so um, really all I wanted to do today was to um, suggest another way of interpreting uh, familiar texts, familiar landscapes um, and to try and get at the ways in which these particular peasants interacted with their um, landscape from, I would argue, an empirical and scientifically based perspective. Thank you.